good morning to all of you today we have a session on image based questions in pediatrics as you all know image based questions are now comprising most of the questions in the neat pg entrance exam and hence this special session dedicated only for the images that can be asked in the exam so let's begin with the session so the first question is you have to identify the given image and the image is this and the options that you have are these so this image is that of a orchidometer and if you see this image clearly you can see these oval balls with a numeric digit over them these digits represent the volume so this image was that of a orchidometer and this is basically used to measure the volume of the testicles the orchidometer was first introduced in the year 1966 by swiss pediatric endocrinologist andrea prader of university of zurich it consists of a string of 12 numbered wooden or plastic beads of increasing size from about 1 to 25 milliliters so this represents the volume the beads are compared with the testicles of the patient and the volume is read off the bead which matches most closely in size so now we come on to question number 2 and question number 2 is a 4 year old child was being worked up for chronic diarrhea on examination he was found to have short stature and had clubbing he was planned for a upper gi endoscopy and following is the image of his duodenal biopsy what is your diagnosis and here is the image and these are the options so the correct answer to this question is celiac disease now it will be easier for you to interpret this image if you know how does the normal duodenal biopsy looks like so this is the image of a normal duodenal biopsy i'm sure you can appreciate the tall villi here the tall villi and now i'm sure you would be able to appreciate the flattening of the villi so there is definite flattening of villi and there is increased intra epithelial lymphocytes here so this image is that of a celiac disease now i'm sure you are very well aware that celiac disease is a malabsorptive syndrome that results because of sensitivity to gluten and the diagnosis of celiac disease is possible by doing serum iga endomycel antibody estimation where the specificity can reach to up to 100% in routine clinics Serum tissue transglutaminase estimation can also help in making a diagnosis of celiac disease. But in patients who are deficient in serum IgA, will have a normal tissue transglutaminase levels. Hence, in patients where you are having a strong suspicion of celiac disease, they if they show a normal tissue transglutaminase level. then you should proceed by doing a serum iga levels and for diagnosis the confirmatory is the duodenal biopsy this is confirmatory and it is also important that once you have got the serology as positive you should not shift the patient directly to gluten free diet why because then if you go ahead with the biopsy of the duodenum these changes will not be appreciated so to make a definite diagnosis the child should be continued on a normal diet as he has been taking taking and then this endo, uh, endoscopic biopsy should be done and the biopsy should be evaluated only after that gluten should be eliminated from the diet now apart from wheat there are two other a uh, cereals which have to be excluded from the diet and that is barley and rye so wheat rye and barley they all have to be eliminated from the diet of a patient who has celiac disease 
Hence, you in this case, you can get multiple questions on celiac disease about presentation, about uh, the diagnosis. Uh, if the patient is deficient in serum IgA, what cereals have to be omitted from the diet and also about certain non-GI manifestations of celiac disease. So, there are a number of non-celiac manifestations of um, non-GI manifestations of celiac disease also which you should know and the important ones are short stature, clubbing on general physical examination, abdominal distension. Rarely patients may also present with constipation, refractory anemia, anemia which is not responding to adequate doses of iron. In such cases celiac disease should be suspected. And you should also screen a child of celiac disease for other autoimmune disorders as well such as Down syndrome and thyroiditis and type 1 diabetes mellitus. So this was in short about the important points that you need to keep in mind with regard to celiac disease. So now we come on to question number 3 and question number 3 is Identify the given equipment. So this is the equipment and these are the choices and the correct answer to this question is ETCO2 monitor. So if you see this image clearly you can very well appreciate that it is mentioning the ETCO2. So what is this basically used for? So ETCO2 monitor is used for assessing the amount of carbon dioxide in exhaled air which assesses ventilation. So this can be used to assess, in fact this can also be used as a means to assess if the endotracheal tube is in place or not. So there is a small capnograph um, uh, ETCO2 monitor which can be connected with the in between the ETCO2 in between the ET and it will tell you the amount of CO2 that is being exhaled. So with this, this can also be a confirmatory test to assess if the ET is in chest or not. The other ways by which you can confirm the position of the ET is by looking at the mist, by looking at the SpO2, by auscultating the chest. Auscultation of the chest and uh, looking at the mist are very subjective findings. So if you uh, use a ETCO2 monitor, it will give you an objective means to assess that the ET is in the chest and not in the stomach. So now we come on to question number four. And question number four is, a seven-year-old child was brought with complaints of gradually progressive pallor and easy fatigability since last four months. On general physical examination, child had pallor and hands were shown as below. What is your diagnosis? So this is the image. This is the image and I'm sure you can appreciate the knuckle hyperpigmentation just see here there is hyperpigmentation of the knuckles and this is characteristically seen in megaloblastic anemia this knuckle hyperpigmentation is seen in megaloblastic anemia now i'm sure you are aware that megaloblastic anemia is a type of macrocytic anemia macro means large so the rvcs are large in size there are more than 100 to 110 femtoliters in size. However, megaloblastic anemia is a type of macrocytic anemia where there is cytoplasmic and nuclear dismaturity. But apart from just presenting as anemia, a child with megaloblastic anemia may also have certain other signs and symptoms. And this is one of the important general physical examination finding in case of megaloblastic anemia. So about 10% of vitamin B12 deficient patients show reversible melanin skin pigmentation mainly affecting the knuckle pads and the oral mucosa. 
It is an under-recognized sign of megaloblastic anemia and should always be looked for in the setting of pallor. And the other cutaneous manifestations of B12 deficiency include vitiligo, hair changes and recurrent angular stomatitis. So these are the cutaneous manifestations of B12 that you need to know. So now we come on to question number 5. And question number 5 is a 10 year old child a resident of Himachal Pradesh was admitted in Piku with complaints of fever, headache, nausea, altered sensorium and lymph nodes since the last 10 days. On general physical examination, the following lesion was found in the groin area. What is the possible diagnosis? This is the image and these are your options. So this basically is a scar and this is seen in scrub typhus. So this scar is seen in scrub typhus. And the scrub typhus is a mite borne disease caused by Orientia sutsugamushi, which was formerly known as Rickettsia sutsugamushi. Symptoms are fever, a primary lesion, macular rash, and lymphadenopathy. It basically spreads to people through bite of infected sugars or the larval mites. A dark, scab like lesion at the site of the sugar bite is also characteristically seen, which is also known as an scar and may help to make a diagnosis of scrub typhus. Symptoms of scrub typhus include fever and chills, headache, body aches, muscle pain, a dark scab-like lesion at the site of the sugar bite, mental changes ranging from confusion to coma, enlarged lymph nodes and rash. Because these symptoms are very non-specific can be seen in any other illness and hence a high index of suspicion is required especially in endemic areas and also a thorough general physical examination is required so that this scar can be diagnosed which will clinch the diagnosis and these symptoms should begin within 10 days of being bitten by the mite. And the drug of choice for scrub typhus is doxycycline. So now we come on to question number 6. And question number 6 is, A 3-week-old neonate is brought with complaints of non-bilious vomiting since the last 1 week. Vomiting is immediately after feeds and is progressively increasing. Parents have also noticed a lump in the mid-gastrium. What is the likely diagnosis? So this is the image and here if you appreciate there is a huge dilated stomach with a narrow pylorus and this is diagnostic of idiopathic hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. So this is see this is diagnostic of idiopathic hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. So classically a infant who has pyloric stenosis presents at around third to fourth week of life with non-bilious vomiting or regurgitation which may become projectile as the time passes. As the obstruction becomes more severe, the infant begins to show signs of dehydration, malnutrition such as poor weight gain, weight loss, decreased urine output, lethargy and eventually shock. The other investigation that can aid in the diagnosis of idiopathic pyloric stenosis is an ultrasound where assessing the muscle thickness at the pylorus and the length of the pylorus will clinch the diagnosis. One important metabolic complication that can result in patients of idiopathic hypertrophic pyloric stenosis is hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. This is easier to remember this metabolic complication by simply applying the logic that since the child is vomiting and the gastric contents there is loss of chloride and acid from the body which results in hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. 
it has been seen that mothers who have ingested erythromycin clarithromycin or azithromycin in pregnancy their male infants may have a risk of developing idiopathic pyloric stenosis in the early neonatal period so now we come on to question number 7 and question number 7 is given below is the image of a oxygen hood what is the concentration of oxygen that can be provided through it so this is the hood this is the oxygen hood which is used to deliver oxygen in smaller children sometimes in neonates and in smaller infants and the concentration of oxygen that a hood provides is close to 90% so oxygen hoods are cylinders or boxes that enclose an infant's small or a infant's head oxygen enters through the gas inlet port so this is the inlet gas inlet port where you can connect the oxygen wire and exhaled gases leaves primarily through the opening for the neck so here from here the exhaled gases will come out hoods provide 80 to 90% of oxygen good humidification and a controlled temperature they also allow easy access to the child for other care so you can see this is transparent so you can also observe the child from here other modes of oxygen delivery to a child include using a non rebreathing mask a venturi mask and a nasal prongs so all of these modes the oxygen hood the non rebreathing mask the venturi mask the nasal prongs they are modes of oxygen delivery so now we come on to the next question and that is a 7 year old child is brought with complaints of fever for 3 days and throat pain the image of his throat is given below what is your diagnosis so here is the image and i'm sure you can appreciate the enlarged tonsils the enlarged congested tonsils with pus points so this is diagnostic of acute follicular tonsillitis so acute follicular tonsillitis is basically acute inflammation of the tonsils with pus points this is caused by streptococcus pyogenes and one of the important delayed complications of this condition is pandas that is pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder and the drugs that can be used for treatment are amoxicillin penicillin v which are oral drugs apart and you can also use benzathione penicillin in a single dose for patients who are allergic to penicillins they can be given erythromycin in a dose of 40 mg per kg per day for 10 days so now we come on to the last question and you have to identify the image and this is a simple one i'm sure and you have to identify this so this is a shakir tape so this shakir tape is a, a measuring tape where you have color coding so you can appreciate the green color here the yellow color here and the red color so this is basically for uh, health workers who are working in the periphery who are screening children for malnutrition so for them sometimes they are not aware of the age of the child many mothers may not know the age of the child they may be dealing with street children or they may be looking after the nutritional status of children in orphanages so when age is not known then they may need to use some age independent criteria to assess the nutritional status of a child and in the various age independent criteria that are available mid upper arm circumference is one of the commonly used parameters and a shakir tape helps to measure the mid upper arm circumference and with this color coding it is not even essential for the healthcare worker to remember the figures when they take the mid upper arm circumference
if the mid upper arm circumference comes here then that means the child is well he can go home no intervention is required if the mid upper arm circumference comes in the yellow zone then that means that the child may develop malnutrition he is at risk of developing malnutrition and hence he needs to be counseled with regard to his feeding the mother needs to be counseled that the child is at risk of developing malnutrition and hence he needs to be taken care of by giving him advice about his diet and he also needs to be called back again for a follow up so that the measurement can be repeated however if the mid upper arm circumference comes in the red zone then this means that the child has severe acute malnutrition and this child will need hospital in patient in facility treatment for his malnutrition he may be having complications he may be having certain risk factors which need to be taken care of immediately and he needs to be admitted for the management of these complications so the, a child whose mid upper arm circumference falls in the red zone cannot be sent home and he needs to be admitted in the center for management of his malnutrition status so uh, this was a short discussion on a few image based questions uh that i had got for you for your practice session for your neat pg entrance exam for many such sessions for a uh, in all the subjects you can subscribe to the unacademy plus subscription which will give you access to various live sessions of all the 19 subjects you will also have access to weekly quizzes and the mega quizzes which will help you to assess your preparation with regard to other students we have special separate doubt clearing sessions wherein you can come up with your doubts and get them cleared then and there so uh, we here at an academy are all here to support you to help you crack your neat pg entrance exam and achieve your dream rank so i hope to see you again in my next class on the an academy plus platform see you goodbye and all the best